Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. Our world is changing fast. And with this comes the need to keep pace, to create, evolve, and deliver solutions that meet our customers' needs and improve their lives. At Swift, we're collaborating with the brightest minds to make transactions faster, smarter, better. Because we believe some challenges are meant to be solved together. With our community, we're reimagining what we can achieve through innovation. Investing in a new AI platform that will power the creation of smarter solutions. Like real-time anomaly detection to validate transactions before they're sent. We're reaching into the world of central bank digital currencies to reduce fragmentation connect up technologies, and enable new possibilities for sending digital money across borders. And we're guiding securities players through the emerging world of tokenized assets, increasing the speed and efficiency of post-trade processing to help a new market grow. These innovations will help our community adapt to finances ebbs and flows, not just to stay afloat, but to thrive and lead both today and in the future. But we're not embarking on this journey alone. We're encouraging our community to join us too, to innovate with us and be part of shaping the future of finance. Faster, smarter, better. Hello everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening and thank you for joining us today. My name is Nick Kerrigan, Head of Innovation at SWIFT and a main member of the Payments Association Advisory Board. So on behalf of the Payments Association and SWIFT, welcome to this webinar. Today, we're going to be focusing on digital currencies, navigating the new reality. Why is this topic vital for us to discuss? Well, developments are moving at a great pace in the world of digital currencies. New types of private money have exploded on the scene over the recent years, and national and global institutions are also responding fast. According to the Atlantic Council, now over 110 countries around the world are exploring a digital currency. And a recent survey by OMFIF showed that a quarter of central banks expect to introduce a CBDC in the next one to two years. So in today's webinar, we'll be joined by an excellent group of industry practitioners and thought leaders from around the globe to explore the steps the industry needs to take to prepare us for this world. To kick us off, we're delighted to be joined by Nikhil Sangani, Managing Director of Research at OMFIF, who will share more details of that research to get us all up to speed on the current status of CBDC adoption globally. And following this, Rachel Levy, SWIFT's head of, uh, Global Head of Innovation Engineering, will moderate an industry panel that will explore the many questions that global digital currency adoption presents. And finally, Rachel will host a case study discussion looking at the recent collaborative sandbox that we've run as SWIFT to understand CBDCs better. So with that, and without further ado, welcome Nikhil and over to you. Thank you, Nick, and thank you to the Payments Association and, uh, and SWIFT to, uh, for inviting me to speak uh, on this important topic. Uh, I'll just uh, share my screen and go through uh, some of the work that we, we have been doing at OMFIF uh, on this topic. Uh, hopefully you can all uh, see this. Um, so yeah, by way of introduction, my name is Nikhil Sangani. I'm the Managing Director of uh, Research at OMFIF. Uh, before I get into some of our findings through some of our work on CBDCs, uh, just to uh, give you all a quick, um, a quick summary for those who may not be familiar with us of, of who we are and what we do. 
Um, so ONFIF is uh, an independent think tank for central banking, uh, economic policy and public investment. Uh, we have various strands uh, and various teams, but what, one of our, our, our biggest teams is our Digital Monitoring Institute, which is a forum for, for policymakers, uh, technology experts, investors, regulators, and various others uh, to explore four major themes. Uh, so that includes CBDCs, and, and I'll be coming on to talk about uh, this in more detail, um, cross-border payments more generally, uh, tokenization of capital markets, uh, as well as crypto assets and stable coins. In terms of our work on CBDCs, there's uh, two key areas that we've explored uh, very recently. Uh, the first is our future of payments report. This is an annual report we've, we've run for the last few years uh, and our flagship report, which covers the future of cross-border payments. Uh, I'm sure it will be discussed uh, later in the session as to the role that central bank digital currencies may play uh, in cross-border payments. Um, but as part of our work for this report, uh, it included a survey from 19 central banks globally on their plans for CBDCs. And that's what uh, the majority of my presentation will be focused on. Uh, I'll also throw in a few insights from uh, a symposium we held just last week, in fact, uh, where we managed to convene uh, close to 100 central banks globally uh, and over a thousand audience members to discuss uh, this very topic on the future of CBDCs. So moving on to some of our findings, and, and Nick touched on this uh, in his uh, introductory remarks, the reality is CBDCs are coming, uh, and they're coming fast in many cases. So we asked uh, in, our, in our survey uh, for central banks about when they expect to issue a CBDC. Now there is 35% in that uh, purple section of the chart that said they, uh, as things stand, they do not currently expect to issue a digital currency. Uh, it's worth mentioning that as part of uh, that group, there were some who have uh, put in steps and are still exploring the possibility of it, but just at this stage, they have not concretely said that they're going to issue a digital currency. There are, of course, many who are actively working on it and are looking to, to pursue this. And uh, as was mentioned before, close to a quarter, the, the lighter blue uh, uh, section there, say that it's, uh, they expect to launch it within the next one to two years. And more generally, those who said that they are going to issue a CBDC say that they're going to do so within the next 10 years. So the underlying point here is that in general, a lot of central banks are working on it and they are like CBDCs are likely to come sooner rather than later. One interesting thing is how the, the thinking from central banks has, has shifted uh, in recent times. 37% are more inclined to issue a CBDC uh, than they were a year ago. None of them were less inclined to, to issue one uh, and about 63% were unchanged. Now, I think there's two interesting things to, to uh, infer from this about the fact that there are a significant portion of central banks who are actively and more inclined to, to move in this direction. I think one of them is that there's networking effects at play in the sense that the more that central banks are looking to this, the more that others are going to, to be brought in, uh, perhaps because they're trying to, to deal with common issues, particularly if it uh, touches on cross-border payments, for example. Uh, interestingly, this is something that um, Carolyn Wilkins, who's part of the Monetary Policy Committee at the Bank of England, who, who spoke at one of our events last week on, on the symposium, who mentioned very actively that a key factor that will determine whether the Bank of England goes ahead with their CBC project will be what other central banks are doing. So this suggests that there are networking effects at play. Another uh, indication is that central banks are able to learn from each other. And the more experiments and pilot projects that are done, the more lessons that can be learned, the more that uh, other central banks will perhaps move in this direction. Uh, for example, one, one uh, participant to our survey uh, mentioned uh, central banks around the world have accelerated their CBDC research and experiments with more and more practical examples of positive experiences. So again, this suggests they can learn from each other and the more central banks that move in this direction, the more that others are likely to follow. Now in terms of, uh, in more specific details as to what, uh, what these uh, CBDC products could look like, generally speaking, um, more central banks are focused on retail CBDCs than wholesale. 
Uh, in fact, we, uh, in this question, over half of them say very explicitly that is a retail CBDC that they're focused on. Uh, still a significant chance say they're looking at it from both a retail and wholesale perspective, um, but very few, uh, in fact, none of them just explicitly stated it is purely a wholesale CBDC they're looking at. Um, so that gives some sort of indication as to what, uh, what type of CBDC might come uh, in the years ahead. Saying that though, and the reasons for pursuing a CBDC, uh, this is where I think things get interesting because essentially there's no clear reason as to why central banks are moving in this direction. And there's significant variation uh, around the world. So I've, I've thrown in a few quotes here from some of the survey participants. So one of them mentioned that one reason they're looking to do this is because it's likely to make cross-border payments more efficient. One of them mentioned uh, it's for financial inclusion reasons. Others have said it's for uh, monetary policy and to improve the transmission mechanism. One very explicitly said that introducing programmability of money will help its financial infrastructure. Uh, and otherwise, in terms of the wholesale side, one central bank mentioned uh, at the bottom there that tokenized central bank money uh, may increase the safety and efficiency of uh, the financial system. Uh, now, of course, there's a lot of uh, concerns in the banking sector in particular uh, and strains, particularly in the US right now. Uh, and you wonder if this may prompt central banks to look even more closely uh, at a CBDC if some of them are saying that it may help for safety and efficiency. But again, the general point here, there's no real consensus as to why central banks are doing this. Uh, and it probably it seems to depend a lot on initial conditions and, and perhaps the aims uh, and monetary policy aims of each central bank, which differs by jurisdiction. Now, moving in uh, more closely on the, on the cross-border payment section, we asked as to what the most promising avenue is likely to be to improve cross-border payments. Here, interlinking CBDCs was the most popular option at close to a third of respondents. But again, there was various other options that were chosen, like uh, interlinking RTGS systems, uh, stable coins, perhaps, and I'll, I'll touch on that in a second, uh, harmonizing uh, standard formats, um, and also other forms. Again, this seems to suggest there's no real clear consensus as to how to approach this topic of cross-border payments, although interlinking CBDCs could offer a useful solution in this regard. Uh, just very briefly to touch on this stable point, uh, stable coins point. Uh, when we asked about what central bank's views were on stable coins, over 80% said it was an opportunity to make cross-border payments more efficient, um, which is significantly more than those who actually said it was a risk to financial stability or a risk to um, because of poor quality standards. Uh, when we did this survey, it wasn't too uh, long after uh, terror collapse, for example. Um, and there's other questions around whether it increases um, uh, risks because of dollarization, which is that third bar there. Again, this seems to be an emerging theme, but there's no real consensus over a lot of these areas, um, but perhaps uh, stable coins are, uh, are more of an opportunity than a risk for central banks. Drilling into some of the challenges now of launching CBDCs and what central banks mentioned to us, Again, I've, I've said this many times, but there is no real consensus here. In terms of what the biggest challenge is, two were flagged up um, by over 20% of respondents. Cybersecurity was one and low adoption was another. Although there were various other risks that were mentioned like bank disintermediation or the need for a new infrastructure which some central banks are not quite ready for. Uh, interestingly, when we ran a poll at uh, the symposium that we ran last week, um, we asked our audience there, 43% said that uh, low adoption is the biggest risk in uh, major economies. So that, that suggests maybe how the thinking may have changed in the past six months or so. This do does beg the question, if uh, low adoption is one of the big issues, what are some of the possible solutions to that? Uh, of course, we've seen in, in many countries that have already launched a CBDC, uh, Nigeria being one example, has seemingly struggled to try and um, encourage the population to incorporate that uh, in their day-to-day -day payments. In terms of how, how that could be approached by central banks, one of them very explicitly mentioned that offline payments would be a useful, uh, useful part of their CBDC, which could entice users. Another mentioned there could be direct incentives at the point of launch uh, for merchants and consumers like discounts. 
Well, they're saying that one very explicitly said that they are unlikely to consider an interest bearing interest bearing CBDC to entice adoption. So again, I've, I've said this many times already, general gist here is that central banks are approaching CBDCs in various different ways. Um, they are doing it for very different reasons, and it seems like they have very different challenges in the way they uh, are going about it. So this really, um, this is really to hammer home the point that uh, it, it's important to look at each use case and each central bank in a very different way um, by the makeup of, of their institution and of the local conditions. Um, in, in many cases, as we found, it's very hard to try and draw out some uh, global conclusions um, from what the path ahead might look like. Having said that, one key point uh, that's worth bearing in mind is that central banks are clearly not going alone on these projects. Third parties are, are very much needed for CBDC development. When we ask these central banks, what are they looking for private sector third parties for? Uh, around two thirds, say for KYC capacity. Um, so this is something that had been mentioned at uh, various times that although um, the authority and, and the, the system would be regulated by central banks, uh, a lot of the actual um, interface with end users will be done by, by wallet providers where the KYC checks are likely to be done rather than being that part being centralized uh, with the central bank. Uh, otherwise, 60% uh, of central banks are looking uh, for external providers to help with the technological development and building the core ledgers uh, and, and other technological capacities. And over 50% said for marketing and promotion, uh, which goes back to the earlier point about how many of them think uh, low adoption is a key risk uh, and are looking to, to others to, to help promote it within their own jurisdictions. Finally, when we're looking uh, in, in more detail as to which types of providers they look, they're likely to work with, um, th there's two sides to this. So uh, the lighter blue bars are who central banks in our sample are currently working with, and the darker blue bars are who they are likely or intending to work with in the future. As mentioned before, technology providers are, are uh, the, key, the key point of, of reference for, for central banks to help them with their CBDCs, which is perhaps unsurprising. Uh, commercial banks, academics and the like are, are also uh, heavily involved. But those that they are intending to work with uh, in pretty much every scenario are greater than those who they are working with now. So this is central banks already telling us that uh, maybe right now the CBDC developments are in their early stages, but as they move closer towards launching it, they're likely to bring other providers in to, to help them, uh, and particularly their commercial banks, which, uh, as you can imagine, for those who are looking at a wholesale CBDC, they're likely to be to be drawn in soon. Um, but also that marketing and promotion providers, which is towards the right hand side of the chart, uh, and also legal services. I think as central banks are getting closer towards launching it, that's when these other providers are likely to to come and help and, and, and support central banks. So just to wrap up uh, what I've spoken about just now, central banks expect to issue a CBDC sooner rather than later. A quarter of them expect to do so within the next one to two years. Uh, more generally, if they are going to launch one, it's probably going to be within the next 10 years. Generally speaking, retail CBDCs are most in favor, but in terms of why to launch it, there's no clear consensus on the purpose. Uh, as mentioned before, there's things mentioned on improving the transmission mechanism of monetary policy for um, cross-border payments, for financial inclusion, various central banks are doing it for various different reasons. On that cross-border payments point, uh, interlinking CBDCs could be a promising option for central banks. Uh, stable points could perhaps provide uh, some help as well. But there are challenges here. Uh, and for central banks, low adoption and cybersecurity are, are their biggest concerns right now. Uh, although there are many risks that have been mentioned. Uh, and finally, central banks are working and will continue to work with many third party providers. They're unlikely to go on this project alone. Uh, and so really the, the, um, the key point within all this is that there's no real consensus as to where CBDCs are going in each uh, on a global scale, but there are many um, stakeholders who are likely to work together um, to, to move towards uh, digital currencies. That's the end of my presentation. Thank you for listening and, and, and thank you for, for the invitation to speak on this. I'll now hand over to Rachel, uh, the Global Head of uh, Innovation Engineering at SWIFT, um, who will be uh, um, moderating a panel. Um, so yeah, over to you, uh, Rachel. Thanks, Nikhil. Just checking, you can hear me okay? 
Yeah. Okay, great. So Nikhil shared with us there that the increased maturity of exploration into CBDCs globally. Uh, and so now we're going to take a, a deep dive uh, by hearing sat from some key industry experts across the globe on regional market developments, use cases of interest, the benefits of CBDCs that they're seeing, and the open considerations that the community is exploring. So today we have with us Lewis Sun, the Global Head of Domestic and Emerging Payments at HSBC, Bianca Maria Morandi, the Vice President of International Cash Management at Intesa Sao Paulo, Dr. Wolfram Seidman, the CEO of G&D Currency Technology, and Alan Lim, the Head of Fintech Infrastructure Office at the Monetary Authority of Singapore. So firstly, thank you all for joining us today. Uh, I'm sure our audience is really excited to hear from you all, so uh, let's dive in. Uh, Nikhil, you mentioned that the reality uh, is that CBDCs are coming and they're coming fast. And with that, it's clear that there's been a, a big rise in momentum in both understanding and exploring CBDCs globally. And this is across both commercial and central banks. Uh, so Wolfram, I'd love to start by hearing from you. H having engaged with such a wide range of central banks uh, across, the, across the globe, uh, could you share with us where you're seeing the most momentum being generated? Yes, thank you, Rachel. And in fact, a huge momentum is currently being generated. Nine out of 10 central banks, as we heard also in Nikhil's presentation, is exploring CBDC. And what really excites me is that they are including more and more commercial banks, fintechs, and the ecosystem um, to create a, a new CBDC ecosystem together. And I think that's key essential since new roles and um, new um, um, regulations also have to be designed and allocated. We see basically two things. We see new technologies are being explored, mainly to address inefficiency of the existing infrastructure, for example, to upgrade the whole um, sales space, to addressing cross-border payments, to increase speed, to reduce costs. But we also see new features are being designed in. And we see that a lot of innovation is created to increase financial inclusion, to reduce the digital divide. And for example, we are currently doing a pilot in Ghana where we experienced in a complete off-grid environment onboarding of um, the population to a digital payment solution. But we also see that uh, these experiments, CBDC can enable new products and services and really drive the digital economy. And many have understood that CBDC is to be looked at as a platform. It's not about designing single use cases, um, but it's more about designing a platform. And let me use an analogy. Do you remember when the iPhone was created in 2005, six or seven-ish? No app was available at that time. There wasn't even the app store available. But today, every single digital business model, actually, you can um, ask, do you have an app for that? And surely we can respond positively. So a well-designed CBDC is the foundation of our financial system in the future and creating diversity of the economy and as a means of innovation um, um, for, for the benefit of the entire system. Great. And actually, there's a question from the audience that, that I want to jump to, which is around the use cases for retail CBDCs. I know from a regional perspective, Southern Europe is really heavily focused on the retail CBDC side. So, Bianca, I was wondering if you could share some insight into this and specifically what use cases are of significance in the retail CBDC space. Bianca, are you with us? Okay, uh, well, well, I assume Bianca's having some audio issues, so we'll move uh, to, to Alan. From, from the perspective of uh, MAS, a uh, central bank at the forefront of, of the CBDC revolution, uh, it would be great to understand where you're focusing your efforts uh, as you explore CBDCs. Well, first of all, uh, thanks, uh, Rachel and the team for the invitation. Um, so from, I guess, from our perspective, the way that we've been looking at this um, is less of uh, approaching this from the perspective that CBDCs or digital currency is the answer. The way we're kind of looking at this is a, a, a constant um, uh, evolution and constant uh, research into the possibilities to improve 
how uh, the bo both the domestic as well as cross-border payment is actually conducted, how we can strengthen our digital uh, infrastructure to support the needs of both uh, domestic uh, usage as well as the broader usage uh, impacting both corporates, citizens, and the wider economy. So that's the lens I think we have been looking at this space. Um, and even on the cross-border payment uh, leg itself, and the reason why I mentioned that, it's a continuation in the process uh, start, uh, starting and perhaps more recently with what we are doing in terms of uh, revitalizing, uh, improving how interbank settlement is actually done domestically, linking the different uh, instant payment system across border. We did a linkage between um, Thailand and Singapore. Um, we've extended it with the linkage with uh, India and we're looking at additional countries moving forward. So where CBDCs come in or digital currency come in is to look at the the uh, the additional uh, step, the additional mile in terms of improving the settlement process. And that's been an area of focus for us. How do we improve um, not just the clearing part of the uh, cross-border payments, but how do we address the issue around settlement? And the investigation that we have undertaken in this space, looking at the possibilities of, uh, we'll say, distributed ledger technology, I guess, originated back in 2016 with Project Lubin, where we looked at the possibilities of digitizing the Singapore dollar, putting it on, on a distributed ledger technology, on a distributed ledger, and figuring out what the possibilities are, whether it's use cases such as atomic settlement, the ability to support programmable use cases. That's been, I guess, the approach that we've been looking at this space. Uh, more specifically, um, with uh, through our experience, investigating this um, domestically, I guess with the research that's been undertaken with Project Ubin, we've understand the possibilities of how this might uh, play domestically. Uh, there has been private sector uh, efforts. They have gone on to commercialize the learnings from uh, Project Ubin. Where we are in the process to look at CBDCs, uh, perhaps more recently, and, the, and I'll touch upon the wholesale before going back to the retail. On the wholesale space, what we've been looking at is the possibility of using CBDCs as a common settlement assets at the market infrastructure level across jurisdiction, i.e. Um, the different parties that are participating in a cross-border transactions using wholesale CBDCs as a common settlement asset between two different jurisdictions. Uh, and the reason and motivation for that is to basically facilitate more efficient settlement across borders, uh, complementing potentially existing instant payment systems, uh, clearing systems domestically, but addressing the specific use case around cross-border settlement. And that's what we've been focusing our attention and, and, and efforts on. Uh, I'll comment briefly on the retail side, just for a bit. Um, so our current assessment is uh, there's no strong, I would say, uh, or urgent need for a retail central bank digital currency in the context of Singapore. And why, why do we say that? Um, the perspective we're looking at, retail payments um, uh, uh, has been in place in Singapore. You can do account-to-account -account transfers using uh, your phone number, for example, as a proxy to be able to send money domestically between banks as well as non-banks uh, 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 financial institution. Where... Where we want to get to, I think uh, uh, the possibilities are, is to inve investigate uh, the possibilities for programmability um, and to support use cases whereby you could have perhaps a more directed purpose of use of money. But in order to get there, we don't think that it's, there's a, uh, necessarily a need to program the money itself. Rather, perhaps the focus should be on programming uh, the use but not the money itself. So I think it's an important point to kind of break that up. Focusing on programming the use without programming the money. So what do I mean? The construct we've been using is this term called purpose-bound money, where you could program through a set of smart contracts, the usage. For example, um, you could direct, let's say, government disbursement. Somebody could use it at particular food and beverage uh, stores within a specific time. But the money itself, that's uh, being used to support that uh, usage does not have to be programmed. In fact, it may not necessarily even need to be a central bank digital currency. It could be in the form of a tokenized deposit, or in some case, you could argue that it could be a well-regulated stable coin. 
So this idea of kind of a, a container, a construct, where you could basically have the money um, associated with a specific purpose, the moment it's completed, the transaction, the merchant, for example, receiving that purpose-bound money, once that is achieved, it's actually unbounded. The merchant receives money without any constraints, could then move forward to pay their suppliers in a constrained format. And that it's the underlying asset could be central bank money, but also potentially other forms of digital currencies as well, provided they're well regulated uh, and have the appropriate safeguards. So that's been the focus of what we've been doing on the cross-border wholesale CBDCs. Domestically, we're looking at the digital currency infrastructure that's required to support some of these innovative use cases that I've just described. Thanks, Alan. I really appreciate you sharing and it definitely sounds like you, you've been hard at work exploring. I'm interested to hear as we move later in the panel about what comes next for, for the exploration of MAS. Um, but there was a question from the audience I wanted to touch on which was uh, asked, uh, which says, uh, what, what should commercial debt banks be doing to prepare for CBDCs? So, so Lewis, I wanted to come to you to hear, you know, as a commercial bank, how is HS? BC preparing for CBDCs, uh, and how are you engaging with the community? Sure, uh, thank you, Rachel, and uh, thanks very much for the invitation to join this conversation, right? Really glad to uh, to have this opportunity to hear the insights from uh, Alan and also from uh, Wolfram, right? So digital currency is an exciting topic, but it's also very nascent, right? So uh, that requires exactly this kind of uh, information sharing discussion and probably debate to figure out the right directions. Uh, in my view, you know, collaboration by all the industry players is uh, imperative uh, to move this forward, right? Uh, let me share some views on like how we're engaging on this. So internally, we have established a drone task force with uh, subject matter experts from uh, all the key relevant functions uh, to lead the development, right? Uh, for myself, my focus is to study basically the impact of uh, digital currency or CBDC to the payment rail, whether a more effective payment rail can be established, which is compliant and also sustainable, right? Our current exploration mainly focuses on CBDC, uh, central bank digital currency. Uh, we've been actually uh, working with central banks in the key uh, jurisdictions where we operate uh, to explore the right operational models and use cases. Uh, you know, Alan mentioned about Project Wuben, right? Back to 20, uh, 2016, uh, we drawn that one uh, quite actively and now expanding to Wuben Plus, which is like uh, looking into the cross-border use cases and uh, SWIFT also part of that. So the, uh, in UK, uh, we also were involved into the consultation paper for digital punks and uh, for digital euro, we also say in the, you know, uh, digital euro design task force, right? Uh, past a few months, you probably have seen also our involvement into the RIN uh, regulated liability network uh, in the US and also UK and uh, some price releases have, have you know, already gone out, right? Uh, so that's the basically involvement with uh, central banks, right? Another element which is also important is really the involvement uh, of our clients or the end users, potential users in the future, right? We've been uh, actively briefing and also educating our clients on what's going on, latest progress in, in this space. Uh, in Hong Kong, uh, which is where I am based, right, we have led an Ambridge project, right? In this project, actually, we've invited a number of uh, corporate clients to test out live transactions so that they can get a, you know, first time information, get a real flavor how a real uh, potential payment reel uh, may actually work in reality. Right, so make sure they also understand what we are uh, in this space this is critical, right? So in all these projects, and we also have many other players joining us, right? Other than central banks, I think regulatory authorities, uh, the industry, SMEs, fintech companies, are all fully involved. Uh, SWIFT, BIS also playing uh, critical roles in many of these projects and uh, our close partners. So we strongly believe like collaboration is a key for the industry to realize the potential uh, of CBDC and the commercial banks like HSBC uh, shall continue to act as a, you know, key partners to uh, central banks and uh, bring our client use cases into the future projects. I probably will take a pause here. 
thanks, Lewis. Uh, yeah, I, I think that's a great message that, you know, that the collaboration here is really key and that the commercial banks should be, be focused to be key partners to the, to the, the central banks and other bodies uh, exploring. Um, Bianca, I just want to check it if we can hear you. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Uh, so yeah. welcome, Bianca. Uh, just jumping back to, to the question I mentioned earlier, uh, there's a number of questions in the Q&A box around use cases for retail CBDCs. I mentioned uh, that Southern Europe is very focused on the retail CBDC side. So I was wondering if you could share some thoughts on the use cases uh, that, have, or, that are of interest and significance. Yeah, uh, I agree very much with uh, Wolfram's message. There is a huge culture change here on the retail side. Uh, there is probably a, a bigger use case for the wholesale CBDCs, bank to bank, like a long time ago when the euro was born. I don't know if anyone remembers that it was mainly, it was bank to bank. Uh, users got it later because this is a culture change, especially in Southern Europe, we're used to physical support. We're using uh, hard cash, checks, promissory notes, postal bills. Credit cards arrive later here than elsewhere, and now they've, they've caught on uh, prepaid cards. But credit cards um, are, uh, are still less used than, uh, than checks or notes or cash here. This isn't going to replace cash at all. It's, uh, it's more side by side, and it's... Uh, but the non-cash is still a very high percentage, and um, we're not seeing it, as as I said, to take cash is place, but in parallel. It's probably as a cheaper, uh, faster to reduce friction. We're seeing, for example, there is this uh, fintech company here in Italy that caught on really, really fast. You, just, uh, you can put something like maximum 500 euros on it, and then we're seeing a lot of young people uh, using their smartphones to pay for ice cream, to pay for each other's uh, for each other's pizza when they go out. Parents can give some pocket money to their kids, and this is how it starts, I think, because uh, users need to start picking this up with a cultural change. I mean, uh, we do have faster internet now than in the past. Most people do have a smartphone, uh, so. I think this is going to do something that, which is really momentous. This is bring, uh, it's not going to replace anything, but bring more competition with traditional PSPs as well. You know, all these uh, costs and expenses and interchange fees. Uh, but of course, until you have the payer and the payee on board, it's not going to happen. Uh, I saw a question go by uh, some minutes ago. I'm a merchant. Why should I adopt it? Because it's going to bring money to your account very, very quickly, and it's going to cost less for you. You're not going to be. Uh, I'm going to the uh, to the supermarket, and I'm seeing lots of different ways to pay, and this is going to bring more money and instantly to your account. So it does make sense for this to happen. Great, thanks, Bianca. Uh, you touched there on, on some of the benefits linked to CBDCs, and uh, there was a question from the audience on what problem is this solution solving? Nikhil mentioned as well in, in his keynote that there's not uh, one answer to this, although we do often hear about the many benefits uh, linked to CBDCs. Uh, so I, I'd like to do a quick fire round uh, and hear it in one minute from, from Alan Wolf from Lewis. What, what do you guys see as the top benefits for CBDCs, and where are you seeing this solving? Uh, tangible problems. Uh, Alan, let, let's start with you. Yeah, so I think for CBDCs, and uh, I'll speak on the wholesale side, I think for us, the focus has been around cross-border uh, settlement. And the reason for that is uh, really to uh, uh, reduce, I guess, the uh, the concerns about the, liquid the liquidity and the pre-funding that's required, uh, possibility across markets. Uh, there are policy considerations um, uh, for, I guess, uh, uh, when you look at the space. Um, on the kind of the domestic uh, use uh, usage-wise, I think it's a bit different. Um, where where we see the, the possibility and why we've been looking at, I guess, again, going back to the purpose-bound money or the PBM concept, it's really look at how uh, we can enable a, a possible future where 
uh, cash in its, uh, uh, its, you have the possibility of cash in its, in its current form, unconstrained, you could allow different uh, possibility of uh, different campaign organizers, different corporates to design specific campaigns, uh, specific financial institutions um, or governments as appropriate to figure out what the use case are. So I think that those are the two lens that we're looking at. Atomic settlement to support cross-border payments and also this idea of, uh, I would say, innovations made possible by composability and programmability of the use of money. Brilliant. Wolfram? Yes, well, I see three major areas. One is interoperability of the fragmented payment system. I think that is really um, where CBDC has a huge potential and can create huge benefits. As cash is the backup for all digital payments solutions today, CBDC will be the backup to all digital solutions in the future. And just to think about um, at the um, point of sale, how many QR codes are picked in? Because there are so many players offering QR code. So let's integrate the CBDC QR code into all of these private ones. And then if you are a subscriber, you pay with the, the, the selected subscription. If you're not, you can also pay with CBDC. So that's a huge benefit. The second area is the innovation that Alan, for example, already touched upon, um, these um, purpose-bound um, payments, which is a, a huge opportunity to um, improve efficiency and provide new offers and new solutions. And here, CBDC can be the highway, can be the infrastructure that can be used by smaller players um, to offer new products and, and solutions. And third is the financial inclusion part. Um, really, CBDC can be the on-ramp to banking services. And um, I think these three areas can provide huge opportunities. So I don't want us to approach the, the discussion, what is the problem to the solution that we offer, but rather to discuss what innovation can it bring? Thanks, Wolfram. And Lewis? Sure, I, I think there are probably many, many answers to this, right? Because we have seen, we have observed a lot of uh, potential use cases. Uh, I very much echo the comments from, uh, you know, Alan and uh, Wolfram, right? So, uh, so far through the experiments we have done, uh, we have seen use cases like uh, FX, PVP, uh, DVP for security settlements, uh, cross-border transfer, uh, and use this for liquidity management, right? Uh, and, and also the programmable money and for specific, uh, you know, conditional uh, payments, right? And the financial inclusion, uh, Wolfram, you mentioned, is also uh, one of the key benefits some governments are very keen to achieve, right? So uh, I, I would say like tangible benefits are, have been uh, observed, but I, I want to add this uh, probably a big caveat, right? So whenever, when we started to look into how we can scale up, right? And uh, scale up the use cases and go into uh, true implementation, uh, for example, on the wholesale side, right? We realized the importance of uh, interoperability and uh, for payment essentially is a network effect, right? So whenever we look at how we can scale up, how to implement this and uh, to really establish a sustainable rail, this interoperability challenge immediately, uh, you know, become a concern, right? Both from a technical angle, from an operational model, to the you know co connection rules, regulations, uh, governance, right? Many angles probably is not actually uh, if we don't uh, agree on the common standards, very difficult uh, for all the players to uh, to really adopt, right? And uh, you know how how can different uh, you know central bank digital currencies and uh, you know by extension and different market participants in different jurisdictions. Uh, to work together to create a truly interoperable and uh, scalable environment, uh, probably is uh, is really uh, the barrier to overcome for this to be uh, truly commercialized. Thanks, Lewis. Yeah, I think you raise a really good point there around interoperability, and I think it's also really important to discuss uh, the areas that are still open in terms of consideration, uh, and specifically those that your institutions are focused on understanding. 
So, so Lewis, I'd like to, to follow up with you. Given the industry will need to ensure some level of global interoperability, but both between other digital currencies, but also existing payment systems, uh, could you share your impressions of this and, and where is HSBC working to explore? Sure. I, I think, uh, you know, I, I, I would actually strongly encourage uh, any audience uh, who has an interest on this topic to uh, probably search online easily uh, for a paper actually uh, released last year by BAS and the CPMI, a uh, very comprehensive, uh, comprehensive paper uh, about options for access to and uh, uh, interoperability of CBDCs for cross-border payments. So in that paper, essentially it summarized, you know, uh, uh, there's no one size fit all probably uh, solutions for this, but uh, it, that paper offered uh, three options for the CBDC interoperability, right? I probably slightly changed the sequence uh, based on my understanding of this, right? The first one is a single system, meaning all participants get on one single system and uh, follow exactly the same uh, uh, set of standards, technical, uh, you know, uh, spec and uh, to, to really, uh, you know, quickly aligned uh, how to operate, right? So the experiment we have done in Hong Kong, uh, Project Enbridge is very much that model. So the benefit of that model apparently is, uh, you know, common set of standards, one single infrastructure, and, uh, you know, agree on the, you know, common set of uh, uh, rules uh, to, to get going, right? But the challenge probably is, you know, uh, is that easy for all the markets, all different jurisdictions in different time zones to actually join one single platform and uh, how to really evidence and certify the robustness and resilience of that one single infrastructure, right? So another model is called a compatible model, meaning like different infrastructures might be used and uh, different CBDC system might be used. However, and they're largely following the same set of standards and, uh, you know, so that you know that the, those are compliance protocols and standards can facilitate uh, sort of a compatible information and uh, you know uh, uh, money exchange right across different systems and uh, maybe also across different jurisdictions uh, that basically uh, can uh, also enhance the efficiency right. So the third model is called a interlink uh, interlinked model. Uh, so which is basically a common arrangement on top of the CBDC systems uh, so that, you know, different system can transact with each other, right? This is model basically, uh, you know, we, we have tested, right? With uh, the Swift sandbox and also MES uh, currently under that, you know, Wuben Plus, right? So essentially, you know, the idea is essentially on top of all the existing CBDC experiments, will that overarching interlinked model be able to build a, you know, sort of a highway on top of highways, uh, so that all the system can be uh, can be uh, you know eventually uh, connected, right? So out of all these models, I I think I don't want to draw conclusion which model is better or you know eventually will will win in the end, right? We believe all of these are actually not uh, mutually exclusive, and uh, actually, in fact, in my view, they are actually complementary to uh, each other, right? And uh, and frankly, uh, this concept also applies to non-CBDC uh, arrangement, right? Like Alan uh, alluded to uh, the real-time uh, RTP to RTP, real-time payment infrastructure to another real-time payment infrastructure. And uh, as an industry, I think we all need to collaborate and uh, to work towards interoperability, uh, not only between the CBDC systems, but also between CBDCs and the fiat rails or the legacy uh, payment channels. Thanks. Uh, I'd like to hear, Alan, if you have any reflections on, on what Lewis shares there. He, he's mentioned uh, the engagements uh, between HSBC and, and MAS uh, within the projects Uben and Uben Plus. So it would be great to, to hear from you uh, on your thoughts. Um, yeah, so so if I could uh, explain briefly on Uben Plus. So it's Uben Plus is the next um, uh, step of our uh, ongoing journey towards developing um, our infrastructure. So Ubin Plus, think of it as focusing around cross-border connectivity um, that's looking at um, bilateral connectivity, multilateral platforms, and also connectivity with um, existing infrastructure uh, based off uh, DLT as well as non-DLT. So I think the, the, the work um, with uh, HSBC as well as other commercial banks in this area has been very helpful because um, 
the idea here with uh, whether it's wholesale CBDCs or different forms of tokenized bank liabilities, the idea here is also to look at how the different forms of money could actually interact with each other. In fact, if I could extend that further, it's also looking at how different forms of um, digital assets could interact with each other. Uh, tokenized financial assets in the form of bonds, for example, securities. How might these actually interact with each other? The other dimension I think it's important to call out as well uh, is how does this, as a kind of a Lewis kind of alluded to, interact with existing uh, market infrastructure? So I think that's where uh, the, the the collaboration that we have with uh, the SWIFT, with SWIFT as well as other central banks around the SWIFT CBDC sandbox, I think it's important for us to understand how these two worlds would actually coexist with each other. Um, I think that's an important frame uh, for us to look into. If I, if you could allow me with maybe an additional point on the topic of um, perhaps some of the issues and challenges that we should really look into. Um, I think interoperability is an important topic, but if we could kind of break that up further, there's the question around network interoperability, but there's also the question at different layers, even at a wallet level, wallet interoperability. So what do I mean? Today, when we travel, we carry maybe a physical wallet with different forms of uh, uh, notes, bank notes, coins, et cetera. When we travel, we don't carry different wallets for different currencies uh, when we travel. Can we have the same experience in the future? If we have different forms of digital currency, will we have a single wallet that allows interoperability at the wallet level that I can actually hold different forms of currencies? Um, some issued by the central bank, some will be actually private money, how might that actually coexist? So I think that's an important area to kind of reflect upon. Um, the other topic also to mention as well, aside from interoperability, is this idea of um, uh, how do we address uh, the singleness of money as the different forms of money interact with each other, whether it's uh, well-regulated stable coins, whether it's tokenized bank liabilities, tokenized deposits, et cetera, as well as CBDCs issued across the different um, jurisdictions, how they might actually interact with each other. FX, uh, liquidity management, I think those are important topics as well. Wolfram mentioned this topic about fragmentation. Uh, I think it's important topic as well. Uh, as we look in the future, it's important that with, uh, I would say, new forms of money that arise uh, from these different efforts that we do not lead or end up with a, a situation where it's more fragmentation. Uh, it's not just, as Wolfram mentioned, maybe different QR codes that display at the merchants, but potentially we want to avoid the situations just to be able to participate and interact with this new infrastructure, we need to have different types of wallets. We need to have different systems that adds up the cost to um, the providers of these uh, solutions, whether it's commercial banks, PSPs, which ultimately lead to a higher cost for uh, the consumer. So I think that's important to keep in mind. Thanks, Alan. Um, I'd like to, to pivot the conversation slightly. There's a number of questions uh, in the chat around um, privacy and, and the control that governments might be able to have uh, when it comes to a, a domestic retail CBDC. And I know, Bianca, that this is a topic uh, that, that is important to you. So I'd love to hear from you what, what your thoughts are uh, and how you, you might be able to address some of these potential concerns that, that consumers might have. Okay, my audio is back on. <laughs> yeah, uh, there are some huge uh, multinational conspiracy theories going on about <laughs> about uh, central banks tracking us and governments tracking us. I think we have to be careful uh, about talking about programmable money because this is not going to be programmable money. Uh, we should talk more about maybe conditional payments. So uh, I think like Alan was saying, a smart contract uh, triggering something. But this, I see this as more uh, for the wholesale, not really for the, for the retail. Um, you know, I, I think if governments want to track us, they could track us today. <laughs> they could see everything that's going on, but they're not really doing it. Uh, it's more about the amount, you know, some huge amounts of money goes uh, hand to hand, especially cross border, they're going to look into that. But if uh, if uh, Ruth is going to go and have an ice cream and spend three euros on it or five pounds, uh, nobody's really going to, to track that, whether it's a CBDC or whether it's paid with a credit card. 
So I, I don't really see that happening. GDPR is not going to, uh, I mean, especially in the European Union, in the United States, in, uh, in Britain, uh, we have really strong GDPR laws. So this is really not going to happen because, honestly, the central bank doesn't care how you spend your coins. <laughs> it's not going to spend how you spend your CBDCs, which is the equivalent. Uh, I think it's more, um, honestly, conspiracy theories. But, yes, cybersecurity is top on this. Uh, infrastructure, of course, but cybersecurity is not going to be one global infrastructure, although I really love how all these central banks, how all these monetary authorities are working together, finally, all these uh, clearing systems working together just to interact with each other. Uh, I've been working for so many years on the SWIFT uh, uh, GPI and the SWIFT Go cross-border payments, and they just stop. It's like I'm trying to track my payment. Where is it when it reaches a country where that's not whose clearing system is not interconnected with uh, international clearing systems? So I think that's something that we need to work on and uh, the actual nodes. That's good security. Thanks, Bianca. So uh, finally, we, we only have a few minutes left. Uh, and Wolfram, uh, I know you've spent a lot of time exploring uh, the importance of governance and operating models uh, when it comes to, to CBDCs. Uh, could you maybe share why you see this as such a pivotal area of focus and what's been do being done in this space? Yes, since we're designing a new ecosystem for payments, I think it's important to address all these aspects, not only the technical challenges, but also the, the regulation challenges. But that's that's mainly done um, by most of the, um, all of the central banks, um, actually. In all projects at Gizing and Darien, we are involved, we focus very much on the platform design. We, we provide APIs to existing systems. We provide SDKs um, to integrate functionality into existing wallets. Um, we provide microservices to the participants. And that is to create a level playing field um, that really allows um, the private sector to innovate. And we're following a very strong concept. The instrument is issued by the central bank, um, but the wallets and the business models are being created by the market. And with, with that, um, I think it, it really creates that powerful concept that the central bank only focuses on areas um, where the market doesn't um, uh, focus on. Um, it provides the highway for the infrastructure um, and the, the enables the private sector to come up with new products and services. And that is really a strong concept, which brings the benefits that we talked about before. Thank you, Wolfram. Um, and Alan, uh, Lewis and Bianca, I'd like to thank you all as well so much for joining the session. Uh, really uh, very enlightening. And I personally could spend a long time asking you all questions uh, with, with all, all your knowledge and experience. Um, so, so thank you for joining us today. No, thank you, Rachel. Thank you, Rachel. So one aspect that many of you raised was the importance of collaboration to ensure global CBDC interoperability. So for the final part of the webinar, we're going to uh, zero in on this topic and look at how SWIFT has been working with the financial community to prepare for a world where CBDCs can be used for cross-border payments at scale. So to do so, I'm joined by Lee McNabb, the Head of Payment Strategy and Research at NatWest, uh, and Nick Kerrigan, Swift Head of Innovation. Uh, so welcome to you both. Um, before we, we get into the discussion, um, as many of you have been doing, please feel free to send any questions in the Q&A uh, part of, of this webinar. Uh, we will try to answer as many of the questions at the end as possible. So uh, first, uh, Lee, could you maybe kick us off by telling us a, a bit about uh, what NatWest has been doing in terms of CBDCs uh, and maybe any sort of immediate reflections on what we heard in the panel discussion? Yeah, cool. So um, hi, Rachel. Thank you for having me. And good morning, afternoon and evening, everyone. Um, so my role at NatWest is very much looking at where the market is going from a payments perspective. NatWest is one of the largest banks in the UK. 
for about 17 million retail customers with the largest business and commercial banks. We, uh, we do the payments for the government and over 100 of its agencies, and we have strong markets, private and international brands. So the reason I say that is that all those customers need to make payments, and we process around one in four through the UK. I think it's about 60 trillion pound in value. So it's inevitable that as a provider of our scale, when the industry starts to talk about new money, about new ways of making payments, we're going to be involved and we're going to help shape what that looks like. So I, we, we've been looking at the impact of digital currencies more generally and specifically CBDCs for several years, probably pre the Libra announcement, but then that intensified the focus. This started in payments, as you can imagine it now as a pan bank focus um, We've worked closely with the industry and the Bank of England over the past few years during the multiple discussion papers, and now we're responding to the consultation. And listen, as you've seen from the panel, it, it's a fascinating time for financial services globally, um, right from the views from Nickel uh, and how every one of the panel members has a differing view from their individual geographies about the impact of this, about the potential opportunity. And all central banks are looking at this now per geography and then also how it could change potentially the, the cross-border flow as well. Um, so we're heavily engaged. We kind of welcome the public-private partnership out in the UK response. That's our focus, right? We're not a global bank like the HSBCs of the world. Um, the industry has to focus on innovation and direction of travel for money, um, but we do need to see the assessment is kind of thorough and complete and ultimately about creating value for all those that are going to be using it. And that's very much taking into account the current roadmap and investment from a payments perspective. Again, the panel discussed this. Every geography is looking at different improvements and infrastructural changes. And when you layer on top the complexity of this, it has to be married into what's the commercial benefit more generally and where's the customer use case going to come into play. Thanks. Uh, so Nick, I'm going to turn to you, and the first question is one that was actually asked by uh, an audience member, which is, given SWIFT's position in cross-border flows today, uh, what role do you see SWIFT playing as CBDCs develop? Thank you, Rachel, and uh, and I think we've had a great uh, discussion so far, so uh, looking to continue that uh, as, as we go through this webinar. Um, I, I think as we heard from Nikhil, right, CBDCs are coming, but uh, as also we heard very strongly, you know, central banks are really looking to solve different things. And so, um, you know, the research that we've done over the last few years and has been, you know, has been borne out by what we're seeing now is that uh, I think we'll see a world with a diversity of, of CBDC design choices, use cases being solved for them, and also diversity of platforms to support them, both DLT and centralized uh, centralized architecture. And, and as Alan rightly referred to, you know, we don't want to end up with a world that's more fragmented than, than it is today. Um, we need to ensure that we don't have, you know, digital islands emerging as a result of this great kind of innovation that's happening in this in this space. Um, so I guess what we saw it as the sort of, you know, the, the sort of challenge that we should focus on in a uh, swift in, in the CBDC space is around interoperability, you know, other uh, technology providers like uh, Wolfram's GND that we heard from have different capabilities, for example, offline payments and so forth. But I think given the experience we've built up over, you know, over, seven, you know, 50 years now around uh, around cross border payments, focusing on that interoperability piece was what we're, we've been trying to solve for uh, in, in SWIFT. Um, the journey moved uh, in 2021, from research into experimentation, we published our first white paper in May 2021, focusing on that enhanced compatibility model that Alan uh, and, and Lewis referred to uh, earlier. But then the community then, uh, from the feedback from that, encouraged us to go further and look for a, a more efficient and scalable solution. And so that's what we then focused on last year in 2022, uh, when we looked to create a CBDC interlinking solution. So a solution that can connect up different CBDCs and with existing payment systems at a technical level. Um, and we look to do that through uh, essentially what uh, you might see in the BIS literature, we might call a hub and spoke solution. In other words, uh, a, a country can connect its CBDC once to SWIFT 
and therefore reach uh, and all of the other networks and, uh, and, and, mar and infrastructures connected to SWIFT. So to reach the rest of the world uh, through, through uh, plugging in uh, one connection. That kind of uh, solution was basically a nice diagram on a slide at the start of last year. Um, but then we worked very, very hard to, to kind of uh, build that experimentally in the SWIFT uh, environment. Uh, we worked with Capgemini to do that, and we were successful uh, in being able to, to build that experimental solution. And then uh, we, we then summarized the results of that and published those results just before, uh, just before Cybos. Uh, last last year, so uh, we've gone a long way in in trying to to you know solve this this emerging challenge of interoperability. Thanks, Nick. Yeah, it's interesting because earlier in the Kills keynote, he mentioned that the, the most promising avenues to improve cross border payments are around interlinking CBDCs and interlinking. Uh, with RTGS systems, so it, it's great to, to hear about the, the work that Swift's been doing, really focused uh, on, on those avenues. Um, and, and so once this initial CBDC solution was developed, uh, we know that it was vital to get feedback from the wider community. So could you talk us through the sandbox, sandbox project that, that we undertook uh, together with uh, many of the institutions represented on the call today? Yeah, ab ab absolutely, absolutely. So once we once we built this experimental solution inside the, the Swift's uh, infrastructure, um, what we did is then we took the, the, the whole of that infrastructure and then deployed it into uh, into a sandbox in, in uh, environment, and then opened that sandbox up to eighteen uh, central and commercial banks. Uh, uh, you know, uh, including uh, NatWest, including HSBC, as we've as we've heard from, uh, as well as including uh, including uh, you know so so you know some leading central banks such as the the MAS. Such as the Banque de France, such as uh, the Deutsche, the Deutsche Bundesbank, and in the sandbox, we really, uh, we really did kind of, kind of two things. Uh, the one is that we, we, uh, the institutions were able to experiment individually and technically inside the sandbox, so to to actually get hands on with the kind of the flows that that we uh, we designed and give us feedback on that. So that kind of really kind of you know was was kind of a very very effective in terms of the kind of learning by doing. And then the second thing that we did in the sandbox was that every two weeks we gathered the whole group together. Uh, and uh, each in each session explored some key design topics around CBDCs um, and, and went deep into them, trying to understand whether the, the assumptions that the weed mage chimed with what uh, those central and commercial banks were seeing or how they viewed that would that, that could work. And um, that was in actually incredibly valuable sessions because bringing together those 18 institutions from across the world everybody has worked on somewhat different things business and technical and so they were able to bring that the you know that knowledge to those sessions and therefore we were able to cover a lot of ground and get to common views much much faster we weren't starting with a blank sheet of paper we we're really harnessing that you know that the, that you know that knowledge so um those those were very uh, very effective uh, effective sessions and you 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 know in the report that we then we then published in March we you know we summarized uh, some of those uh, considerations and shared them with the wider community hey thanks Nick. so so Lee what why did NatWest decide to join the sandbox project and uh, maybe you could share with us the sort of the why but also the what in terms of the role of NatWest and the team that joined yeah so um multiple levels really we saw it as an opportunity to ultimately help shape the future to be at the table that is discussing and conversing around the challenges and the opportunities. And to be quite candid, it was also a way of improving our own knowledge and providing a really interesting piece of work that was exciting for those, um, those that were involved. Similarly, we were involved in the, in the hackathon that led up to Cybos as well. So we're quite a progressive, innovative bank. <laughs> I say that without smiling. Um, and, and ultimately, again, yeah, we want to look to be collaborative um, and drive the market forward, as, as Nick has said. The project team itself was, was a real Pan Bank group effort, shall we say, um, obviously payments involved, but that was multiple levels. That was payments technology. That was our cross-border tower. Um, we had broader technology involvement from our digital asset world. Uh, we had part of our innovation team involved. We had part of our treasury team involved, and they were supplemented by um, SMEs dropping in where, where needed. Now that sounds like we have uh, a full team. I think on the on the panel, uh, Lewis mentioned that he has a has a task force. I don't think we'd say we'd have a task force per se, 
Um, but we did have a kind of merry band of people who were really interested and above all else, kind of curious, mm. um, ultimately just trying to make a difference, but bring something back selfishly to Nat West in terms of what are other people thinking? What are the challenges? What are the thoughts? What are the fears? What are the opportunities um, in a nice collaborative atmosphere? Yeah, I think that that's what collaboration is all about. So uh, that, that's great to hear. I guess in terms of uh, the actual project, what type of transactions were, were tested and how, how were these performed? What, what was the role that NatWest was able to play? So you could you could take part in the sandbox and play a role of, of any participant in inverted commas, even though we're a commercial bank, we could have played the role of, of a central bank, of a, of a commercial bank, of a, of a um, of an FX provider, of a bridge, whatever whatever it might be. I mean, I can let Nick go into the details of the transactions, but I think Nick, if I remember rightly, there was up to about 5,000 transactions tested between Correct. different blockchains um, and ultimately across the different and traditional fiat currencies as well. Because I think to the point that came out on the panel and Nick, you mentioned it, the fear of creating a fragmented world, but in a, in a, in a kind of future-proof digital way is, is quite real. But also we have to recognize that Every country, although they're on the journey, they're on different journeys and at different points in that journey. So the yeah. timelines are very different. It's not often discussed that 85% of banks are talking about, central banks are talking about digital currencies, but they're all at a different point in that journey and they all have different aspirations, as Nikhil called out earlier. And there will be a point where there is a central bank digital currency in X country, but in another country, there's not. There's just a traditional RTGS and a traditional settlement process and a traditional fiat currency. And that was the beauty of the sandbox. How do you create that interoperability? Because it, we are not just moving from A to B. We're not just moving from an existing world to a world where everyone has exactly the same type of CBDC, built in exactly the same way, working in exactly the same operating model. Yeah. That is not gonna happen, that's a reality. So that interoperability point is, is really key. Yeah, and I think it's clear there that the task there that Swift sort of undertook to, to build a, an interlinking solution was a difficult one. And there must have been Nick, various aspects relating to the design of this. Alan mentioned many of the, the, the potential benefits of a CBDC atomic settlement. Uh, and you mentioned that the sandbox was a great way to validate some of these design assumptions. Uh, could you maybe talk us through uh, some of these uh, design decisions and what the feedback was from the participants yes yeah, sure and and you know opening up that that sandbox to be honest we really wanted to learn right um and uh, you know at swift we 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 you know i'm pretty humble in this space right we have some very smart people at swift but equally there are thousands more smart people across the, across the industry uh, and so you know bringing in the experts for example from uh, from 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 lee's group for example or, or others was just you know was just super super helpful to 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 un understand that and as as lee said yes we had about 5000 uh, transactions that ran across uh, the the sandbox in in different forms between uh, uh, between the the Corda and Quorum blockchain networks, as well as the RTGS uh, that 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 we uh, that we that we simulated, um, in terms of design, um, there were some you know there were there were sort of important kind of considerations and things uh, that we went through. So we we discussed important topics like access models. We talked into important topics like. Uh, like atomic settlement. In some of those, in some of those uh, topics, um, there was kind of a, a high degree of consensus. Um, in some of those topics, there were sort of ones that you know where there could be different views, but uh, we were able to sort of capture those views and the and the pros and cons. And in some of those topics, actually, you know, the participants encouraged us to actually to go further. Than, than we had done in the experimental solution. So an atomic settlement, for example, what we designed um, in the solution is, is, a, is a mechanism we call release funds, which is effectively what you might see as a kind of two-phase commit model. And the participants said, yes, that, that works, but we'd actually like you to, to think about uh, how we can accom accommodate fully atomic settlement in that in that solution as we go forward. So actually, we brought fully atomic settlement into uh, the next version that we've been we've been working on. So that was that was very helpful in terms of uh, you know understanding the needs and then actually uh, kind of you know helping us helping us you know learn and iterate going forward. Thanks. 
Um, th th there's a few other topics that, that, that were uh, both discussed in the soundbox, but also mentioned in the panel today. Uh, one of them is the topic of FX and liquidity. Uh, Leah, I'd like to start with you and hear what your thoughts are on this uh, particular design consideration. So it's massively important, both are, right? Um, and, and what's fascinating is that as we go through this journey, we just need to recognize that we don't all know the answers yet. And that's the point of this collaborative approach. We looked at FX settlement and if this would happen within the payment flow or not. Um, many thought an out of network approach to FX settlement would be likely given current market structures. But to be frank, I think the jury's probably still out. Mm. Could synchronicity be ensured between off and on chain movements? Could the likes of CLS continue to be used for FX? Um, multiple options to, to work through effectively. From a liquidity perspective, again, what was fascinating it, and, and I think understandable was that views across different participants differed, right? It ranged from strong supporters seeing kind of efficiency gains in liquidity management benefits coming from reduced time to process and complete across border payment, the obvious one, lower costs from shorter duration to hold liquidity. I think that came up in the panel mm. to the kind of fear of fragmentation, as I've said, of liquidity between fiat currencies and CBDCs, depending on that level of, I don't think we've used the word fungibility yet, so I'll throw it in there, the level of <laughs> kind of fungibility. Faster transaction speed combined with, that you mentioned the gross atomic settlement point, so yep. interesting to see how we go in that in that next phase. Could reduce the efficiency of liquidity management if netting mechanisms were not available for CBDC transactions. So again, lots of questions really, and I don't think we've got the answer yet. And What's fascinating as we go through the Bank of England consultations, as they're trying to understand how they are building this, we need to both focus on that domestically, but also recognize that depending on how we build in the UK, will then drive some of the answers to these questions around the cross-border piece as well. Yeah, thanks, Lee. Uh, and I guess a more general question, with the first round of the sandbox uh, complete at the end of last year, what are your main takeaways for, from that project? Um, I mean, firstly, I'd strongly recommend anyone watching, listening, uh, if offered the opportunity to participate in the likes of this, then then take it. I appreciate it's not always easy. Capacity is constrained at whatever organisation you are. It's the same challenge for everyone. Um, I think takeaways wise, the two, two levels, really, like at the market level. And then I guess, as I said earlier, being honest, the internal benefit for us and, and our colleagues um, money can't buy the opportunity for developers like this, so, so they love it, right? They properly soak themselves into it, as, as you well know. Um, for this to be successful, we, we must work together. That's a takeaway uh, in an open and safe framework. Um, the likes of this, and this is not the only piece of, piece of work, I think um, Lewis may have mentioned RLN, the Regulated Liability Network. Look at all the biz projects like Nexus, Enbridge. Um, ultimately, as more and more POCs pilots, sandboxes, whatever you call them, come out, we need to be able to use them to help shape the market and help inform the central banks. But let's be frank, a lot of very intelligent people around the table, they don't have the answers either. And they're very much looking to the industry, the likes of the people watching, the likes of the people on this call, to help shape what that looks like. And, and that's a big takeaway. Takeaway, there isn't really an answer yet, but actually the, the importance of processes like this is, is, is massive. And it's vital that we keep collaborating as we go through. Thanks. So uh, before I turn to Nick to hear about uh, what comes next, uh, I, I'd like to hear from you, Lee, on your initial impressions of the solution uh, that, that SWIFT presented in the, the sandbox and the approach that SWIFT's taking overall to, to, to enabling global CBDC interoperability. Uh, logical, right? So Nick and I were on a panel at um, <laughs> the Cybos last year. Yeah. And, and I kind of made the point that SWIFT was created, and you, you may have made the point, Nick, sorry, SWIFT was created 50 years ago to ultimately solve the fragmentation that existed in the market and provide that central infrastructure to allow money and messaging to move globally. And what you're doing now is quite right. I would do the same if I was sat in a Swift chair. Well, how, what role do we play in that future world? So the outcome of the sandbox, the, the, the technology that's being built and being considered makes logical sense. As we've seen from the panel though, in this conversation, there's still so many questions to be answered around how each central bank is building and applying this. I think we've probably skipped over the why question a little bit from a domestic UK perspective, but that's fine for this part for this discussion. But we shouldn't ignore it. 
Mm. And, and then that will help shape the true how. So who builds what, where, why, who owns what. The commercial model is massively important mm. as well. I think that, again, is an often overlooked topic. Um, and that is against the backdrop. Um, I think Alan may have mentioned it on, on, the, on the panel. There is a significant amount of investment already underway in each geography, especially in the UK, to improve payment infrastructure. How does this fit? And then how does the SWIFT work fit at the same time? Yeah. Uh, so actually, before I, I go to Nick to hear about what's next, uh, there was a question from the audience on exactly that, Lee. So we, we don't have to skip over it. And the question is, in the UK, how likely is it that CBDs, CBDCs can be more efficient than both card schemes and the new payments architecture with, with open banking? So, so maybe you, you want to touch on that now. Well, there's probably a nuance behind that question that is close to my heart, to be fair. Um, I, I, I do challenge the, the why. I, I do challenge with the trajectory that the UK is on, the maturity we have from a digital acceptance perspective, from a card acceptance perspective, the journey that open banking will be on. I do wonder and question, well, what does digital money or a digital pound in this case, what would it do in this scenario? How would it work? And ultimately, we're a big bank, but we've got millions of customers. What difference does it make to our customers? And if we're going to build this as an industry, why, why, why are we building it? And, and that needs to be part of this consultation. And it's not just banks responding, everyone responds. I think the Bank of England have recognised that the June deadline, it's not really going to be a deadline because this is going to be a 9, 12, 18 month collaborative discussion process where kind of arbitrary, you've got to respond by the 9th of June with all the answers, just won't work because it's, it's not as simple as changing rule one to rule two in a reg, reg book. This is changing money and how we deal with money. Um, so that question is is kind of one one close to my heart, um, and we need to, as an industry, work together to answer it. Thanks, thanks, Lee. And I think that echoes a lot of what the panelists were saying earlier. I mean, a, a, a huge amount of what I'm hearing today is on the importance of the collaboration and the industry working together across regions, across different types of institutions. Um, so I, I think that's a, a great message to get across. Um, so with that, Nick, uh, a successful first phase of the sandbox uh, now over, C could you share with us what's next for the SWIFT CBDC exploration? Will we see more collaboration? Uh, ab well, absolutely. Um, and, you know, as, as you know, we, we are huge fans of collaborative uh, innovation and that being, you know, a way of bringing the industry together. As Lee rightly says, nobody has all, all the answers. Uh, at, at this stage, but I think with these collaborative efforts, we can continue to build the knowledge base of the industry around it and figure out, you know, uh, you know, in turn, some of the the, the most plausible answers to some of these uh, so, to some of these uh, these questions. So I think that's uh, that's uh, that's kind of uh, vitally uh, vitally Im important. Um, in terms of the the the, the solution itself that that we designed, uh, you know. Uh, one of the key takeaways from the report was that the 18 participants said that they saw clear potential and value in this experimental solution we designed, and they encouraged us to go forward with that, and they said they wanted to work with us uh, on, on that journey. So uh, inspired by that positive feedback, what we've been doing over the last few months is working really hard to develop what we call a beta version of that, uh, that solution, which is a more robust version that we can connect up with uh, central banks uh, test networks. The development work on that beta version is, is now uh, complete. And so we're now going to move into a phase of uh, testing that beta version with select uh, central banks, and, and that will start uh, very shortly. And then in parallel with that, uh, with that, we also want to start exploring new use cases. So uh, the, the current use cases we've been looking at were very much payments focused, so payment transfers and payment versus payments. We now want to expand uh, into uh, new use cases and open up a phase two of the sandbox. Um, and we'll be inviting, uh, uh, you know, all of the institutions that worked with us before um, on to come with us on that that phase two uh, sandbox journey, as well as opening up for uh, for other institutions to to join us. And we hope to get that uh, that phase two sandbox uh, started uh, kind of late late June. So we're really kind of moving forward on 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 this uh, on on the on this. Uh, pathway very actively engaged, and will to continue to collaborate uh, with the wider industry. Sounds very exciting. 
Um, so with that, we have a few minutes left. Uh, uh, there's a, a lot of questions that, that have come up during the session, uh, and some of them we've already had time to ask. But, but I'd like to ask uh, each of you one specific question that, that has come up uh, multiple times. So, uh, Nick, a question that's come up uh, a few times, and the, the theme is really around ISO 20022 uh, mm -hmm. and how this is actually going to impact the adoption of, of CBDCs and what role it might play as we think about new forms of money. So, so wondering if you can tackle that for us. Yeah, uh, uh, absolutely. And and, you know, the context and backdrop to this is that in March, we started the coexistence period of ISO 20022, uh, which is a kind of transitional period to the full adoption of ISO 2022 for uh, cross-border payments. So the, the you know, the, the industry has been very invested very heavily in ISO 2022 as the common language for payments. And you can see many benefits that can result from that. Uh, having richer structured data uh, around uh, around payments uh, m messages. Um, so as we then take that and look at CBDCs, I think it's important that we take an approach where we look at each of the sort of the challenges and opportunities that we have around the design of CBDCs and we say, which of these ones are sort of genuinely net new that we haven't been able to solve before? And which of these ones uh, do we actually have, you know, some solutions to already that we can effectively repurpose? And I, I place ISO 2022 very much in that latter category, especially important because, as, as Lee rightly highlighted, uh, you know, we're all of these kind of uh, the CBDCs are, are going to be on different you know, phases of, 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 of journey and timing of implementation. So we actually, even more important to have a common language around, around uh, payments. And that's why you'll, you'll see um, in, in, uh, in the solution that we've been developing, uh, ISO 2022 is a key part of that um, because, you know, we can then leverage that, uh, that investment and also leverage that to be able to get the CBDCs to be able to talk to existing payments infrastructures. Thanks, Nick. Um, and Lee, quickly, as quickly as we can, um, one question that, that comes up a lot is on the impact uh, to commercial banks and especially around the access model, the role of intermediaries. Uh, this question has come up in this chat a number of times, uh, but also we hear it in many conversations. And I know it was talked about um, at some length during the Sandbox project. So could, could you share with us uh, your, your thoughts on the impact there? Uh, do you know what the impacts are multiple right from a from a commercial bank perspective i said it earlier we started looking at this from a payments lens but then when you realize that ultimately banks only do three things pay money which is move money hold money and lend it that movement of money is critical and when that movement of money is going to be sat on someone else's ledger and banks ultimately lend money based on the money they hold it starts to become a really important treasury credit related conversation and debate. And you've seen from the consultation that Bank of England is looking about capping the amounts that can be held. Um, but when that cap covers 95% of the people that get salaried in the UK, it starts to realise actually this could be a really potentially big impact. From an access operational model, obviously PIPs will be massively important within the UK. Um, I can't imagine many commercial banks not wanting to be a PIP and ultimately being at the forefront of that customer engagement. Um, I think it's the, I forget the other acronym, but there's kind of additional services layered on top of the PIP. EISP maybe is one, but there's too many acronyms and I, and I keep forgetting them. Um, but it's it's that one. <laughs> um, again, massively important to the competitive lens that's applied um, to what will ultimately be a complex access model we need to work through. I'll stop there because I'm conscious of our time. Thank, thank you so much. Um, and thank you both for, for a great discussion today. Um, uh, with that, uh, I want to share that if you're interested to find out uh, more about SWIFT's CBDC solution and sandbox project, uh, you can use the QR code that's on the screen now to download uh, the recent paper. Um, and of course, uh, SWIFT will be sharing uh, as they uh, continue their efforts in collaborating uh, with the market. So, so thank you, everyone, for joining today. I'll now hand over to Nick, uh, who will give some final thoughts and wrap up the session. 
Great. Um, well, thank you, everyone, for joining. I think that was a super uh, insightful and enlightening session. Thank you, Rachel, for, for your moderation uh, of, of the, both the panel and, uh, and, and the discussion that we, we've, we've just uh, had. I think in terms of key takeaways, I mean, from Nikhil's keynote, we, we heard that this is a trend that's happening, but it's also a trend that's going to be uh, very kind of multifaceted. I think we heard from the, the panel there are multiple uh, things that, you know, central banks, commercial banks looking to solve for different models of, of how to do with that. I take away, and I think it continues to underline that the financial community needs to continue its work uh, together to ensure interoperability uh, of CBDCs. I, I think I would say in conclusion that we see that digital currencies, you know, are becoming a new reality. And so, you know, firms across the ecosystem need to uh, respond, act quickly uh, and make sure, uh, make sure they're ready. Um, special thanks to the Payments Association for hosting uh, this, this webinar. Um, this is, of course, just one of uh, many thought-provoking webinars that the Payments Association uh, organises, uh, and you can see the link on the screen now to find out uh, the, full, uh, the full events uh, uh, calendar um, for, the, for the year. So uh, with that, uh, thank you everyone for joining today, and let's close the webinar.